Marty, the hammerhead shark, make their journey safer in the future. That's right. Hi, everybody. I am Tamara Poles, and welcome to the Virtual Science Expo. I am here today with Dr. Dahl Finn, who absolutely loves the story, Marty, the, ham the hammerhead shark. And notice Dr. Dolphin is wearing her mask, always being safe. And because we are in a safe environment, I'm actually going to remove my mask. Just like that. So now you can see my facial expressions. Isn't that awesome? All right. So today we have a wonderful session in store. We have Dr. Alex Hearn on, on the line. And guess what? He studies sharks. How cool is that? He studies sharks. Dr. Dolphin is so excited. Dr. Dolphin actually wants to become a marine biologist as well as being an awesome dolphin. And what's awesome is Dr. Hearn is a marine biologist. And on this call today, we have three, count them, three awesome featured so uh, schools here. And I will tell you what uh, who they are. We have Southwood Elementary School, welcome. We have Sedgeville Elementary School. Welcome, y'all. And lastly, we have W.G. Pearson Elementary School. Welcome, y'all. Thank you so much for coming. So today, Dr. Alex Hearn, which once again, study sharks. How cool. He will be reading an amazing book called Marty the Hammerhead Shark. Welcome, Alex. Hi, how are you? It's so great to be here. <laughs> I'm doing well. Thank you so much for being on. So can you actually tell us what's a marine biologist do? Well, let me take my mask off because I'm also in a room on my own. So no risk here. Well, a marine biologist um, studies life in the ocean, basically. And more and more, we're beginning to learn about this enormous ecosystem that we didn't really know much about until recently. I mean, I guess we go to the beach, we maybe catch a fish, <laughs> but we didn't really understand much about how the animals of the ocean live, how they behave, uh, where they move and how they move. So a marine biologist studies all those kinds of things. That's so cool. That sounds amazing. I'm so excited. And I know the folks on this call are also just excited to hear more about what you do and more about Marty the Hammerhead's shark. And for the schools that are on the call, if you have any questions at all for Dr. Hearn, please feel free to drop those questions in the Q&A portion. If you're having any technical difficulties or have any questions, comments, or concerns that we need to troubleshoot, please feel free to drop those into the chat. So questions for Dr. Hearn in the Q&A and any technical issues, drop those into the chat. And if you're tuning in on YouTube, if you have any questions, please feel free to email those to ncsciFest at unc.edu. All right, so take it away, Alex. All right, well, good morning, everyone. It's so cool to be here and to share this story of this amazing little shark called Marty. Um, but before I start, um, I just wanted to throw a question out to you guys. Um, how do you feel when you hear the word sharks? Um, and maybe you can send me some messages and we'll see if you feel the same way at the end. Because shark, the word shark tends to inspire lots of different feelings in lots of different people. So I'd just be interested to know how they make you feel. Um, just as a little bit of a background, um, I, I, I'm not a shark biologist um, by training. I actually, um, I was always crazy about lobsters and crabs and how they're the king of the reef. Um, and, and that's what I studied. So, uh, so I was studying lobsters and crabs, which are also really cool animals. Uh, and then one day I, I kind of had to change uh, and I'll explain why in a little while. Um, so I'm going to share my screen with you now. Let's see if we can get this done. All right. So this is, um, so this is the story of Marty the Hammerhead Shark. And I actually have my version in here, but you can see my version. My version is in Spanish, um, but that's OK. We, we work in both languages here. Um, and the story of, of Marty the Hammerhead Shark, it's, it's, it's based on real life. Uh, it's like the adventures 
of all the hammerhead sharks in one individual, okay? And where I work nowadays is, is a place called the Galapagos Islands. And the Galapagos Islands are really famous for many, many reasons with the giant tortoises and Charles Darwin. But if you go underwater, you get on your diving gear and you jump in or you just hold your breath, you can find yourself in a world like no other. And this photo was taken by a very good friend of mine, Jonathan Green, um, and we work together on projects underwater. And that's like our office. That's like our backyard. And we are so lucky. And when we're out there studying sharks and we're surrounded by these big schools of, of hammerheads, um, we do start thinking about, well, you know, what does the future hold for these animals? Because sharks are under threat. And we wanted, we wanted to write a, a, a book about how sharks behave and what are some of the things that might be threats for them. And we were really lucky too. Um, with, with my team, we, we studied baby sharks and we never found a baby hammerhead for many years. And then one day we had to change the way we were working and by accident, we caught this little guy, um, actually this little girl. <laughs> and, uh, and we were so pleased and we, we took the photo, we let her go. And we realized that this, the area where we're studying by the beach was an area where we, we, we can catch baby hammerheads. And so we realized that Galapagos is an important place, not just for the big adults, but also for the babies. And so the story of Marty the Hammerhead begins pretty much right here. This, for those of you who may have been lucky enough to, to visit the Galapagos Islands, is, 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 a, is a little rock called Kika Rock. Um, and it's right off the island of San Cristobal. And that's where we have our campus, that's where we work. And the people in San Cristobal, we call it La Isla Bonita, the beautiful island, because San Cristobal is a beautiful island. So I'm just gonna read some of the story to you and then maybe we can have a little bit of a chat about some of the things that happen, okay? So here we go. Early one January morning, the Galapagos sun rises. Rays of sparkling sunlight shine through the mangrove lagoons of San Cristobal Island, La Isla Bonita. Creatures appear from hideaways where they spent the long night avoiding predators. Colorful Sally Lightfoot crabs, see them up here in orange, skip across the water's edge and shoals of small fish dart between the roots. An eagle ray drifts slowly by. Suddenly, a gray shape speeds past in a cloud of dust, chasing a tasty squid. It swiftly turns its hammer-shaped head, swallowing the squid whole, its last meal until twilight returns. The gray shape is a young shark, a scalloped hammerhead pup named Marty. The safe lagoons have been Marty's home for nearly four years, and they protect her from predators and strong ocean currents out at sea. Marty knows every part of them. Many other marine animals share their habitat with Marty. Black tip shark pups enjoy the shelter of the tangled mangrove roots, and small fish and invertebrates feast on the fresh nutrients that are washed in on every tide. Small lava herons, you see just here, they stare into the water motionless, waiting to catch a fish, and brown pelicans balance their huge bodies on the waxy leaf branches. Graceful green turtles bask at the surface, resting after a night of laying their eggs on the nearby sandy beaches, and a Galapagos sea lion zips around, chasing fish. These are lagoons that are full of life, huh? And you can even see some marine iguanas up there too. Those are only found in Galapagos, nowhere else. But all that life Soon, it will change, and many of those animals will leave, and they'll never return. Marty peers through the mangrove branches out towards the deep blue ocean. She feels restless and frightened, and other sharks in the nursery feel the same. It is time to say goodbye to her home. She must leave and enter the mysterious world of the open ocean. Worrying thoughts dance through her mind. Is she strong enough to battle the big stormy ocean and currents? What dangerous predators might lurk out there? Will she be fast enough to escape them? 
How will she find food on her journey? Will she be able to find her way? Those are kind of worrying things to think about, right? I, I, I sometimes feel that like Marty at this point is feeling like when you're going to go to a new school or, you know, when you're growing up and you're changing class, you're a little nervous, right? But you know it's time to go. The urge is to leave is too powerful to ignore. She must leave. Marty swims through the water, moving her powerful tail from side to side. Kick a rock appears in front of her, a giant rock face rising into the sky. And below the waves, swirling shoals of fish dodge the jaws of the speedy sea lions, and hawksbill turtles munch greedily on the coral and sponges. Blue-footed boobies dive off the rock like arrows, their sharp, sharp beaks spearing unsuspecting fish, and the magnificent frigate birds circle overhead. You know those guys? They don't fish. They just steal the fish from other birds. They're the pirates of the ocean. Marty is startled as a mass of bubbles suddenly rises from underneath and hit her body. She can see some strange shapes moving amongst the rocks below. Jets of bubbles stream from each one and long black fins power them through their water. Frightened, she swims away to join the other sharks. So what has Marty just seen there? You know what? I think she's seen some of our students. I think our students are diving there, doing some kind of survey on corals. And you know what? Sharks don't like bubbles. You know how some people say, you know, people are afraid of sharks. Well, sh sharks are afraid of people. They don't like bubbles. And if you're wearing a tank and you're making a lot of noise, it sounds a bit like Darth Vader from Star Wars. And so the sharks don't like that and they tend to move away. Leaving Kicker Rock behind, Marty begins her epic adventure. She passes Santa Cruz Island and tiny Pinta Island too. A colossal sunfish glides through the water past her. As it reaches the surface, it turns onto its side and its flat body soaks up the sun's warm rays. Marty swims further and further until she reaches right the top of the archipelago. She forgets her hungry belly and tired muscles as she reaches Darwin's Arch. What a sight! Before her lies the most spectacular scene, an underwater oasis of sharks. Hundreds of hammerheads circle the deep ocean currents. Silky and Galapagos sharks are among them too. You know, there are so many different species of sharks. There's like 500 different kinds of sharks in the world. And here in Galapagos, we have hammerhead sharks, but also those silky and Galapagos sharks too. And they kind of mingle together. Marty's sense of excitement grows as she joins the increasing school of sharks. They have a long journey ahead of them. A diver suddenly appears in front of Marty and he's approached the blind spot right in front of her nose. She quickly turns to swim away and she doesn't feel that the diver has placed a tag on her fin. The diver knows that the bubbles from the tank scare sharks, so he's learned to free dive and he can hold his breath underwater. Well, why do you think the divers put a tag on the shark? And that looks like it might be a bit of a nuisance, right? The thing is, those tags are really important because as scientists, they allow us to follow Marty's movements so we can understand where she goes. And if we can tag enough sharks, that can help us understand what kind of areas they move about, and it can also help us protect them. So that's, that's why this dive is doing that. Near the protection of Darwin's arch, Marty spots a dark shadow in the distance. It grows bigger and bigger as it approaches, filling the whole ocean before her. She freezes, what could it be? A cavernous mouth opens wide, sucking in tiny, tiny hundreds of plankton in one big mouthful. It's a whale shark, the biggest fish in the ocean. Marty has heard stories about these majestic giants and their mysterious appearance every year in Galapagos. Beautiful white spots, ah, oh, here we go. Beautiful white spots cover its body. She knows that each whale shark has a unique spot pattern, a little bit like a shark fingerprint. Gazing up as it swims overhead, she decides to follow. She's curious to learn more about the giants of the sea. The whale shark is called Lucia, and she notices the small hammerhead swimming beside her. So she slows to let it swim alongside, knowing that it's beginning her first migration. 
The sun sets in the glowing orange sky, and Marty leaves the safety of Galapagos behind, swimming side by side in the shadow of her new protector. Lucia has migrated between Galapagos and Cocos Island many times. On this occasion, she's happy to have some company. She can help guide young Marty on her journey. As the last speck of land disappears over the horizon, a faint sound echoes through the water. A beautiful song swirls on the ocean currents. It's the song of the humpback whale, Lucia explains. Males are calling from hundreds of miles away on their journey to warmer waters. The soothing sounds follow them. Suddenly, a flash of silver swims by, leaving a trail of bubbles, and another one, and another one, as they swim into a shoal of yellowfin tuna. Tuna are one of the fastest fish in the sea, says Lucia. They can grow bigger than you are now, Marty. Sadly, we're kind of running out. Marty washes, watches in disbelief as the tuna circle around a shoal of fish. They gobble up every single one. A smaller tuna called Tulio speeds off towards a young turtle ahead, which is kind of gliding peacefully through the water. Tulio playfully leaps out of the water as Tico the turtle surfaces to breathe. Tulio's body flashes silver in the sun before disappearing below the waves in a big splash. Soon, they're all swimming together, marine travelers on an epic adventure. Spectacular underwater mountains guide the travelers closer to Cocos Island. Marty swims ahead excitedly to join Tulio, who's kind of showing off his strong sprint muscles and speed. As she tells tales of adventure to Tico, Lucia notices a familiar sight in the distance. She pauses, a look of alarm crosses her face. She's seen those nets before. She knows what tragedy they can bring. Lucia remembers calling to her whale shark friends, but then it was too late. They hadn't heard her water, her warning, and had swum straight into disaster, trapped in the huge nets of an industrial fishing boat. Lucia never saw them again. Feeling angry, she realizes that she cannot let this happen again. Marty and Tulio will not be captured. Lucia powers her immense body through the water towards her friends, but they're trapped. Bubbles of panic cloud the ocean. Terrified shoals of fish struggle against their net prison. Okay, think slowly, Lucia tells herself. There must be a way out. She remembers. Her whale shark friends had tried to swim to the bottom of the net before it closed shut. Marty and Tulio must do the same. She begins to swim down, looking into the eyes of her terrified friends, encouraging them to copy her movements. Despite the panic and confusion, Marty spots Lucia on the other side of the net. She sees her swimming frantically towards the seabed and she peers down. Aha, there's the gap. Of course they must swim down. She turns to Tulio, but he's frozen in fear. Marty pushes him with her head, guiding him towards the bottom of the net. The gap is getting smaller and smaller. Tulio squeezes through, through, but it's too small for Marty's wide head. Marty hears the calls of her friends. With a final rush, she hurtles towards the small gap, turns onto her side and flicks her tail just as the net snaps shut. She's made it. As the net lifts higher, Tulio's relief turns to shock. He realizes the rest of his shoulder has been captured and there's nothing he can do. The friends continue their journey towards Cocos. They feel lucky to have escaped, but they take special care of Tulio, who's still deeply upset because he's lost all his friends. As they near Cocos, though, a sense of excitement builds. A magnificent underwater world appears before them. A rainbow of colors and bright corals sparkle in the water. Huge shoals of tropical fish swim alongside silky and hammerhead sharks. And some sharks, they slow down and they turn onto their side. And they enjoy being cleaned by the smaller fish who nibble on their little parasites and the old skin. It's like a spa. They're getting a nice full-on treatment, those guys. Tiger sharks stealthily cruise the reef, searching for animals that make easy prey. Now the friends can relax in the safety of Cocos. They made it all the way from Galapagos. They feast on the plentiful food and enjoy the company of others. Soon though, It'll be time to move on. As more hungry tiger sharks arrive, Tico will figure it's time to leave for the shores of Malpelo in Colombia. Tulio will explore the open ocean once more, finding a new shoal to race around with. 
When Lucia leaves off to visit the waters of Peru, Marty spends more time with her hammerhead friends, her new hammerhead friends at Cocos. And at night, she heads offshore into the deeper waters, waters, bravely dodging fishing lines to feed on squid. As the season changes, Marty will become restless again. She will be ready to make the return journey. Her adventures will begin again. In the years to come, she'll be ready to have pups of her own. The information provided from the tags on Marty and other sharks will help scientists to make those journeys safer in the future. Okay, and that is the end of Marty and her friends' first adventure. And I'm sure those guys are gonna have many more adventures together. I hope you liked it. Yay! Dr. Dolphin loves it, and so did I. Thank you so much, Dr. Hearn, for the awesome story about Marty the Hammerhead Shark. And while you were reading that story, our Q&A blew up. So for those of you that tuned in a little late, just as a reminder, uh, if you have any questions, especially if you're a featured class on this call, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A function. And if you are tuning in on YouTube, please feel free to email your questions at ncsidefest at unc.edu. So I will start with a first, couple, uh, first few questions that actually came in via email. So from our YouTube viewers. So first question is, uh, what does it feel like to touch a shark? Well, that's a really good question because shark skin is made up almost of tiny little teeth. So it's like feeling sandpaper. It's really quite rough, but it's specially designed so that it can swim really, really fast. And in fact, it's so well designed that sometimes champion swimmers get their swimsuits made up of material that's similar to shark skin. That's awesome. Yeah. That's so cool. Sharks so I, teach us. <laughs> that, I, I think I need to get one of those swimsuits. <laughs> I certainly do. I'm pretty slow. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Uh, another question uh, that was emailed to us is, where did you do your Coast Guard work? Well, I, I, I'm not a Coast Guard, but I've done a lot of work around different parts of the world. So especially in Ireland. So I've done a lot of work in the Orkney Islands, which are north of Scotland, and they are amazing. And they have Viking ruins and Neolithic, I mean, they are awesome islands. And then I did my work in Galapagos Islands, which are also awesome islands, and then some in Cocos. Um, so I've been around, I've been around a little bit, done some work in California too, so yeah. <laughs> nice, that's awesome. Uh, we have another question from one of our featured schools. Um, and this question is, have you ever found any shark's teeth? Actually, yes. Um, we have. Um, sometimes um, when you have a lot of baby sharks in, in a nursery area, sometimes there's too many of them um, and there's not enough food. So some of them could starve and die. And so sometimes we found, you know, the skeletons of, uh, of sharks on the beaches or, or their teeth break off because they're hunters and they're fighting, right, um, to, you know, with their prey. So sometimes their teeth break off. So yes, sometimes we found the, 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 the teeth of the little babies. They're small, but I'll tell you something, they're sharp. I bet. And speaking of teeth, we have another tooth-related question. Do you know, on average, how many teeth do uh, sharks lose in a year? I don't know the answer to that question, but they they will lose teeth, in fact, and it'll probably depend on, on the type of shark, right? But sharks have different rows of teeth because they, they need those teeth to stay alive, right? So they need to make sure they have a good supply. So they almost have like a conveyor belt. So when their teeth fall out, they can just replace them with new ones and keep on going. So I imagine they lose a fair few in a year, yeah. What? I need that. I want replacement <laughs> teeth so I can eat all the candy I want and drink all the soda I want. That's what I want. What yeah, I want? You, you might have a bit of a tummy ache after that. <laughs> That's a good point. Didn't think about that. Didn't think that through. <laughs> um, also, well, we have another question that came in via email. Uh, why do whale sharks eat such small prey since they're so large? That is a really good question. Um, 
And, and there's a few shark species that have adapted to eating that small prey and they're kind of separated out. So in, in, in warm tropical waters, we have whale sharks, oops, wrong one, <laughs> whale sharks. Um, further in, in cooler waters, we have basking sharks. And then in deeper waters, we have a really mysterious shark called a mega mouth. And that's my dream is to see a mega mouth. And those are the three sharks, they eat plankton. And so they, they specialize these filters um, in, their, in their mouth. So when they gulp in large amounts of seawater, of sea they they, they've just got these filters. So all the plankton stays in. And they found a way to be able to do that so efficiently that it's, they can get enough food to grow to those enormous sizes. It, it is pretty impressive. That is awesome. And like speaking of food, because you have me eating and drinking all the junk food with the tummy ache, you have the giant whale, whale sharks eat, um, eating plankton. What about, what do hammerhead sharks eat? Well, hammerhead sharks um, are, are pretty specialized uh, out in the open ocean in eating squid. Uh, and that's why they hunt at night because squid will come up from deep water closer to the surface at night. And then the hammerheads can head out and find them. And, and they can use, uh, they can detect like little, the signals from, that, from, the, from, from, from the squid and they, the electrical pulses and psh, grab them. So that they're really specialized hunters. Some of them also, when they're smaller, they can eat other things like crustaceans and stuff that's in the lagoons. Um, but mostly they'll eat squid once they're older. That's so cool. And I love that you are saying words that actually help me with these questions because the next question is about electrical fields. So amazing. Uh, so this question is from one of the school, one of our featured schools, and it says, do hammerhead sharks use electric fields to find their way in the ocean? Well, we think they do. Um, that's a very good question. I don't know if, I'm, if my computer's gone crazy here. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yes, in, in sharks have these little gel packets um, in their head that allows them to detect um, electrical signals. And uh, hammerhead sharks in particular have loads and loads of them. In fact, I was trying to bring up that picture of, um, of a hammerhead and yeah, you probably, can I share my screen? Um, let me uh, see. You should be able to. Let me see if we can do that because there, it's, it's worth having a look. Um, hammerhead sharks have loads and loads of them. Now, I don't think it's allowing me to right now. Um, where are you? And what we think is because um, these little gel packs can detect electrical signals, they can also detect magnetic signals. And because the Earth is magnetic, right, we think they can orient in particular directions. So, yes, they can. We, we think they can navigate using using those little um, Ampoli of Lorenzini, they're called, in their heads. It's called what? Ampoli of Lorenzini. That's a oh, mouthful, huh? <laughs> did you remember that? Are you going to remember that? Gel packs. Okay. This guy's going to remember it for me, because I Can can't see, pronounce that. Yeah. Can you see? Um, Here we go. You're sharing right. your screen now. Yeah. Can you see all these little dots around here and around in there? Might not be clear enough, but there's all these little dots all around the head of the shark and all those are tiny little gel packs and those are the ones that can detect the electric signal it's crazy that's so cool i don't have those and... it's the force <gasps> hammerheads are jedi it is the force yes who knew hammerheads were jedis that is amazing and uh, and speaking of hammerhead uh jedis weren't we as humans sounding like vader and underwater that you mentioned earlier <laughs> How cool is that? That's awesome. Uh, and speaking of us being underwater, sounding like Vader, um, have you ever been chased by a shark? Uh, no. Um, That's good. Uh, <laughs> sharks, in, in, there's lots and lots of sharks in Galapagos. I think sometimes sharks are curious. Um, every, every, every shark has their own personality. Sometimes uh, when we're diving, um, because we're breathing special gases, on the way up, sometimes we have to stop at about 15 feet and wait for a few minutes. And so we're just hanging around. And sometimes silky sharks kind of come around you and they're like checking you out and they come close, but never in an aggressive way. Um, no, we haven't been chased by, by sharks. I've been chased by sea lions. 
that's scary. Wow, sea lions? <laughs> They're so playful, but they can get, you know how a, a playful dog can get a bit rough? <laughs> yes. That Absolutely. kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. And uh, we have a time for one more question. And since we have elementary schoolers on this call and a variety of people viewing this, um, this, the show, could you tell us uh, if we want to become a marine biologist and want to be you when we grow up, what should we do? What should we get into? Should there be classes that we should think about taking? Should there be clubs or something outside of school that we should be doing? Yeah, I, th I think um, it's, uh, I, th I think you, you've got to study hard. Um, you want to make sure that you're doing well in biology, of course. Um, math also helps. Math is really important. I wish I'd done better in math. Um, geography, uh, understanding how things move and mapping that kind of stuff is really good too. Um, you know, I, th I think that's the main thing. And, and there's, there's some really cool um, clubs. Uh, there's, there's, there's uh, I know in the US, in several states, there's something called the Gills Club, which is specifically for, for, for girls who want to learn more about sharks and becoming shark researchers. That's really important too. So a shout out to the Gills Club. Um, they are awesome. Um, and yeah, and there's lots of volunteer work that, that people can do, maybe helping out in aquariums, maybe also just thinking about how you interact with the ocean, right? And, and making sure that, you know, you're, you're helping to make that ocean a clean, safer place for the animals that live in it. Uh, and there's plenty of books and stories and documentaries and things. And also tell your folks, you know, you don't have to be afraid of sharks. <laughs> Yeah, don't be afraid of sharks, guys. So you heard it from you heard it here first. If you want to be a marine biologist, you got to study hard, uh, take some biology class. There's also math classes, which are also just as fun, and join some clubs like the Gills Club that the, uh, that was mentioned earlier. Um, I, have, I have one thing. Maybe I don't know if we have time for, but I actually have a little video that we took of Marty. Um, so when we were out in that bay that I was telling you about at the beginning, it's like 30 mm -hmm. seconds. Yeah, uh, go ahead and show we it. We had a video. We just had a GoPro. We put it in the water. It's completely amateur. But this is what Marty looks like. How, how can you not think she's the cutest thing in the world? So let me see if I can share that with you. Share screen. Let me see. And we will press play there. Can you see that? Oh, my gosh. Look at Marty go. So Dolphin. she's tiny. You Check know? out Marty. That's your friend. Look at that. Oh, and a puffer fish came to say hello to her. There we go. That's amazing. So adorable. Okay. Hey, Marty. Go, Marty. You can do it. Go, Marty. Right. Go. Go, Marty. Go. <laughs> go, Marty. Go. I love it. Thanks so much for sharing that awesome video of Marty, the hammerhead shark. I'm, I love the fact that we met him. Um, well, thank you so much, Alex, for uh, joining in today and sharing your awesome knowledge of sharks and reading that amazing book, which once again, Marty, the Hammerhead Shark. Um, shout out again to our featured schools, which is Southwood Elementary School, Sedgefield Elementary School, and W.G. Pearson Elementary School. Um, if you want to know more about um, this session or more about science in general or want to see more science content check out ncscifest.org and i hope you guys enjoyed the show as much as we did <laughs>